So we've got a full day today, church. Well, good to see y'all here. Um, just a couple of announcements for us. Next week we'll be at Beehive Civic Center, and we will have uh, uh, we'll have our fellowship potluck lunch. Then, and then things are going to get kind of get back into a, a routine in December. Now the voting is over and it's all that. That's why we've been displaced as a church it is. the last couple of months. So anyway, next week at Beat Eyes, we'll have our fellowship lunch there. Okay. Uh, and then the following Sunday, we'll be back here on the 24th. And that's going to be a great day in the Lord. We have two baptisms that day. And, uh, and it's going to be awesome. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Also, we have... Uh, on the 21st of December, we will have our children's uh, Christ Christmas program right here at Kimbrough. And there'll be more details on that as time comes, but that's on the 21st of December. And Ann and, and some others at the church have really been working on that. I'm looking forward. It's always, it's always an incredible uh, event when our kids participate. Is that right? So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then at the very end of service today, we're going to we're going to serve Lord's Supper. So I'm looking forward to that. We have a great day in the Lord, and and uh, I'm going to ask Dan to to start us off uh, with something. And before we do that, Carolyn, will you uh, just say a blessing uh, over the tithes and offering for us today? Lord, I'm grateful that you said you would supply all of our needs according to your riches in heaven. Everything we have belongs to you anyway. It's our job to just praise you and thank you and be obedient because obedience brings favor. Thank you, Father, that we call in multiplication with every dime, every penny, every dollar that's given here today. We decree multiplication that it will come forth to the kingdom of God and supply these needs. And you're a God of more than enough. You said you gave your hand of light in that word, honey. I'm thanking you for that word only. Thank you for the church. Thank you for our needs. And thank you for blessing our lives. We just ask you, Father, to bless all this money that comes in right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The uh, tithe and offering box has been MIA over the last few weeks, but back in its uh, designated spot. <laughs> thank you. Tomorrow we observe Veterans Day, so a little bit of uh, history on it. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, an armistice was declared ending World War I. It stopped all the hostilities that were going on, the great world war that was going to end all wars. You know how that went. Uh, in the following year, in 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, which is actual time when, quote, if the war ended, but Armistice Day of November 11th was honored by Wilson <coughs> in the 1919 and was designated that we should observe that every November 11th. And a lot of other countries went along with it, too. In June of 1926, Congress passed a resolution that November 11th should be observed as Armistice Day. But in 1938, November 11th became a federal holiday, which it had not been before. After World War II and the Korean War, the name was changed to Veterans Day. We no longer call it Armistice Day. Well, we never called it Armistice Day. We're not old enough, but it was changed to Veterans Day. Uh, in 1968, another change was made. The federal government wanted to get, uh, they called it the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, and they wanted to make sure that all federal employees had a three-day weekend. So they designated that Veterans Day would be celebrated on the fourth Monday in October. Well, there was a lot of states that didn't like that, and it was observed that November 11th was really Veterans Day. So in 1975, President Ford signed a new law returning the observation of Veterans Day back to November 11th, starting in 1978. So now we celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th, and everybody that knows a veteran, thank them for their service. Amen. 
a little fact that I didn't know until I researched this, there is no such thing as a national holiday. That may sound hard to believe. The federal government makes holidays for the federal employees, and the states usually go along with it. So it's not really the federal government saying we have a national holiday. It's they have the holiday, the states all go with it, and that's why we celebrate the national holiday is the way that it is. And that's Veterans Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. For those of you who don't know, Dan is a veteran. Amen. Thank you. So is somebody else in here, right? Thank Crystal. you. That's what Crystal. I was looking for. Crystal. That's right. Crystal. I thank y'all for your service. Thank Some you. Help. I want to ask you if you'll stand now as we worship <laughs> our Lord.
ago when I worked in the restaurant business, I'd gotten out of management and decided that I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to be out of restaurant management. But I stayed in the restaurant business and um, waited tables. And I'd done that before. I put myself through college pretty much waiting tables. <clears throat> um, but uh, anyway, so one night I was, I was waiting tables and I was taking an order. And off to the corner of my eye, I saw something topple and I caught it. Well, at this restaurant we had these heavy, heavy wooden uh, high chairs. And they were to put toddlers in. And, but when a toddler was too small for the high chair and they were in their baby carrier, we turned it upside down yeah. and put the carrier in that space. And we just thought that was the most ingenious idea <laughs> until that day when I was waiting tables and it toppled and I just caught it. Y'all hold on to that for a minute. We're taking a break from the seven feasts this week. We're going to finish that up next week. And then I want to remind you the following week is your chance to share with the church what you gleaned from the seven feasts. Whether it was something that was uh, that you learned from what I brought or you did some digging on your own. Uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about the seven feasts and what you've learned. So, uh, the reason we're doing that is because I'm going to ask Roman and Renee to come on up. I stopped Renee in her tracks. She was booging right on along there. Lisa, if you'll come up with them. <clears throat> So church, I want to introduce you to our new deacon, Roman Sermon. Woo! We've got a little gift for y'all there. And um, so I'm going to ask y'all to sit in the front today. All right. <laughs> Today's message is titled, Being an Acts 6 Servant. And I'm going to tell you that this message is especially for y'all. So somewhere down the road when someone says, have you ever felt like the preacher was giving the sermon especially for you or directly talking to you? You can confidently say, yes, I am. During this message, I, I may say Roman, or Roman and Renee, or a church. Just know that it's all the above, whatever I say. Okay? I'm talking to us all. Amen. Fair enough? Yep. Amen. So oddly enough, the title of today's message is found in Acts 6. Can y'all believe that? Wow. I want to ask y'all to turn with me now to Acts 6. Acts chapter 6. I'm also going to ask that you stand with me as we honor God while we read His Word. Acts chapter 6. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned uh, and the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. 
but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Verse 8, and, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And, when stir and, and they stirred up the people, the elders, and scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Please be seated. <clears throat> Church, I want you to know that about three months ago, after counseling with Dan, it was decided to approach Roman and Renee with this business of being a deacon. And I, when we met with them, at least I met with them initially, when we met with them, I asked them to pray and have plenty discussion among themselves including their children about what's being presented to them and offered and asked of them. I gave them some information to look over and encourage them to call me with any questions or concerns that they may have. And I assured them that there was no time frame on this, that I wanted them to be, be comfortable with their decision and that whatever their decision was, it was all going to be good. I wasn't worried about it. So fast forward a couple of months. Last week I mentioned to you that I had a revelation during Trace Diaz and I intentionally didn't reveal that revelation to you because I was saving it for today. So just a quick recap. I, I fast almost every Trace Diaz. <clears throat> when I served, and so I was, uh, I was struggling a little bit with not not being assured of my reasoning behind my fasting, and I wanted, I was, I was questioning, was my heart right? Was my intent right? What was I hoping to gain as a result of doing that fasting during those weekends? And so, in a very, very intense moment, God put this on my heart. Because he knows I've been struggling with this. And he put this on my heart. He said, Cross Point Church doesn't have the leadership in place for growth. Wow. Cross Point Church does not have the leadership in place for growth. And later on in that weekend, I thought about Jesus talking about building on the sand and building on the solid rock. And I believe God was saying you're, you're building on sand right now. It's solid. Wow. I had already approached Roman, like I said, a couple of months before. And I've been struggling for a few years about growth. And one of the things that we've really worked on is, is discipleship and, and having spiritual growth for that readiness of the physical numbers growth. But that one really put me at ease. And it also let me know, I, 
should probably keep on fasting during those weekends. <laughs> So a few days after this revelation to me, I approached Roman about it. I said, hey, have y'all have y'all had a chance to pray about it, talk about it, and uh, if you have any questions or if you made a decision, you know. Remember I said, you don't have any time frame, and here I am asking him about it, right? I'm sure he thought the same thing. <laughs> uh, but after that revelation, during that fasting, I really felt compelled to approach Roman about it. And we, we've had a couple of conversations since then. We had, uh, we had one that Dan and Joy joined Lisa and me uh, with Renee and Roman. Mexican food may have been involved. I'm not sure. I want us to take a closer look at Act 6 today. I'm reading most of this out of the New King James Version. The heading on the paragraphy on it says, Seven chosen to serve. Verse 1, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now some of the version, the translation you read, say in food distribution of food but the reality was there were there were more things than just the food involved that they felt like the widows were being neglected so my first question to you today is ever heard a complaint in church <laughs> now no i don't mean i don't mean cross point i know there's never been a complaint here i'm going to all the other church ever heard a complaint the best I could tell when I was going through all of this, this is the first time that it was recorded of an issue within the church. There's infighting, as it were. Those, these two factions were the Hebrews, and they, they were natives of Israel who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. And the Hellenists were Jews, but they were from the, the Greco-Roman world. And they spoke Greek. So this is happening, if you remember that very first verse, the first part of the verse, this was happening in a growth period. So they were going through some growing pains, y'all. And, and in the result, there were things being overlooked. You know, that's, that's a lot of times what happened with, with rapid growth. Things fall through the cracks. Some maybe not so important, but some other really, really important things. And so this was addressed, and the apostles didn't take light of it. But we see even in that early church that there wasn't perfection. I think sometimes we go to church expecting that perfect church looking for everything to be just like we want it to be. And I saw something this week that really hit me. It says, if your church shortcoming, shortcomings distress you, ask yourself, would a perfect church have me? That's a tough one, isn't it? And if the answer is no, <laughs> let's just go ahead and start today about improving and making your church better. Amen. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Amen. So next, the 12 were presented with this issue, this problem. And so verse 2 says, Then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And it's my belief that the, the apostles didn't think this work was above them. It's just, it's just my belief that if they were distracted by this, then they weren't answering their true calling amen. of evangelism. Yes, okay? So they needed to continue to devote themselves 
to what God had called them to do. But it was a real issue, right? There's no question about that. It required a real solution. They needed help, and they recognized that fact. So in regards to the importance of serving tables, I'd like to go back to the great high chair in 1960, as it became known, or as I named it last week. <laughs> but don't you think those parents maybe walked out of there with a different perspective about serving tables than when they got there? Yes, sir. I know I did. That was over 30 years ago, y'all. And Lisa and I haven't talked about it in a long time, but we did this week. And my point there is, this is not a small thing, y'all. It's not a small thing. No. It's not a mundane task Amen. that you're being asked to accept. Amen. It's a vital part of a healthy, growing church. Amen. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's funny because, man, I've read this, this over the last three weeks. I have read chapter 6 over and over and over again. And up until a few days ago, it didn't hit me. But verse 12. Two says, then the twelve summoned the a multitude of the disciples and said, it is, not good, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve the table. Verse 4 says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Amen. So they're adding that on there. They're realizing that's a, that's a big part of it too. And it made me think about this. And I want us to say this is something we should never forget. We've got to be continually in prayer because the spiritual warfare is continual. Yeah. We don't just pray once and it goes away, y'all. Right. I want to go back to verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Church, I want you to know of the 15 verses in this, in this chapter, this is the one I struggled with the most. And if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll explain that to you. Years ago, I was part of a startup church, and I was appointed the first elder of that church. And then as the church grew, we added elders, and we call them lay pastors but their deacons is the same thing. But, but, uh, but it became my way of vote. And to a large, to, to a degree, I won't say a large degree, to a degree, it was a popularity contest. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't remember any of those votes where it was explained, this person is full of wisdom, this person <laughs> is full of the Holy Spirit. None of that. It was just a list of candidates. Yeah. Wow. So I don't want you to feel like that I'm talking to you, church. I don't want you to feel like um, this has been dismissed by you not being included in this decision. And I've especially seen it with pastors, when pastors were, were voted for. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Apostles were getting into some meat, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And we had too many occasions where we voted for a pastor in that church. There's some here who know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I saw it firsthand. That essentially the process of voting for a pastor was window dressing. Oh. Okay? 
while a corruptive abuse of power was percolating for control. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So there's no malicious intent, church. Amen. By excluding in this in this decision. Now back to some scripture. Verses 3 and 4. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. I can't, I cannot definitively say this, but I believe the we there in that passage is the apostles. You could say that we as the apostles and the church. But I think ultimately the apostles were saying, y'all present some folks and we may appoint them. Verse 5, and the same pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip, Prochorus, Lacamor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. From this may be the first time and the only time the church was pleased. The whole church was pleased, y'all. <laughs> the multitude was pleased. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Roman, there's going to be some decisions made and some actions taken. It might not just set right with every single person in the church. Yeah. I'm going to tell you that. Yeah. Welcome to leadership. <laughs> Amen. I believe because the apostles were so intent on doing the right thing, they chose all those men from that Hellenist faction. Those are all Greek names, y'all. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now, I believe the laying on the hands in this situation wasn't to, for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us in verse 3 and verse 5, they were already, they already had the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in them, right? Because the apostle says, choose seven who have the Holy Spirit. That was one of the requirements. Yeah. So it wasn't for that, but it was to set them apart. It was to set them apart for carrying out that ministry that they were called. Verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I think there's a couple of noteworthy mentions here. First of all, there were priests, Jewish priests, they were converted to Christianity. It says it right there. Yes, sir. And then the other is the word of God spread. I did a little research on that. And what I found out was there were six progress reports uh, recorded in Acts. This is the first one. Right? Then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. Roman, I think I speak for the church when I say I look forward to hearing good reports from you Amen. in this calling. Amen. So now let's move to the second part of Acts. It's, 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 we're seeing more about, um, really more specifically about Stephen. But there are some really good things in here that we need to grab hold of. I read two different headings or rock piece. One said Stephen is arrested and, and the other said Stephen is accused of blasphemy. I don't know, but the one that says Stephen is arrested caught my attention. You know, accused of blasphemy, that's one thing, but it doesn't really talk about the action that happened. That talks about the action. Stephen was arrested. Yeah. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Church, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that signs and wonders aren't, uh, aren't confined 
to an apostolic ministry. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. But Stephen was not an apostle. But he did great signs. Great wonders. And I'm thinking this, woman, reading that. I'm convinced that the more your faith grows, so will your power. Amen. Yeah. Verse 9. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, disputing with Stephen. Now the synagogue of the freedmen were Jewish people who were freed from Rome, and they started their own church. I guess you might say, but they, there was a synagogue there in Jerusalem. And it made me, I, I, I couldn't help but think about this. Years ago when I was, uh, was I, I was still in, I was in that same restaurant uh, company, and there was a convention of restaurant companies. Uh, it was out on Lake Conroe. And there was a guy there who had been terminated from the company I had worked for, and another company had hired him. And he had beverage director. <laughs> and our human resources person said, anybody can have a title. And I'm thinking about this. I want y'all to know this, this uh, synagogue of the freedmen. I'm not sure about that. But I want to say this, anybody can have a title. Okay? And, and But this is for illustration purposes only. So if you're a descendant of the synagogue of the freedmen, <laughs> please don't be offended. <laughs> but we see in this verse also, it didn't take Stephen long to stir up the pot, did it? No, it didn't. didn't take it long at all. Okay. I'm going to tell you, Roman, doing the right thing, Start. oftentimes will stir the pot. Yeah. Amen. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. That verse right there, just, I don't know why, just empowered me. It says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Oh darn, they weren't able to resist. They weren't able to resist God. They weren't able to resist the spirit. They weren't able to resist the wisdom that was being spoke over them. Hallelujah. And I'm thinking, our, our testifying is not about saying the right words. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's a spiritual battle that is going to require the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us as witnesses. Amen. That's what testimony is about. Amen. Verse 11, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. We're going to come back to that. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. Some of the verses, some of the versions I read right there, said they brought him to the high priest. At that time, you know who that high priest was? <laughs> the same one that accused Jesus. Yeah. Verse 13 and 14. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. To me, that's humorous in itself, y'all. Moses came down and they were already sinning and, and built idols and everything else. <laughs> By the time he got down from the mountain that, the, that he delivered, the word that he delivered from God, right? So I just find that just crazy funny. Jesus faced nearly those same charges and accusations. So, Roman and Renee, I want y'all to know this. There very well could be some chatter. You don't deserve this. You're not, you're not worthy of this. You don't qualify for this. There could even be some false witnesses against you. I want you to know that you have a church body right here ready to go to battle with you led by 
the supreme warrior. Verse 15. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Even Stephen's enemies could recognize God's presence in Stephen's life. Church, is that you and me? Can our enemies see God's presence in our lives? So as a follow-up, I want to encourage everyone to read two different passages. First is uh, Acts 5, 34 through 39. And it's really, it's really powerful advice that these leaders did not take heed of. But he really lays it out. And then in, in Acts 7 in its entirety, that is an amazing sermon. That Stephen gave. And the thing about that, he didn't, he, he very, I, I think he defended himself, but it wasn't about his defense. It was about how he went on the offensive. It's a powerful, powerful chapter for us as Christians, y'all. We've got to be on the offensive. Amen. Defense is over. We got to be ready. Amen. But we see Satan's warfare throughout in chapter in uh, Acts six. The first we see is division, disunity, and distraction. We see it in verse one and verse nine. Verse one said, "Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were." Neglected in the daily distribution. That's all three right there, y'all. That's division, that's disunity, and that's distraction. Because it said, now in those days the church was growing. <laughs> now Satan doesn't want that, does he? And then verse 9 said, Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, and those uh, and disputing with Stephen. So those two we see division, unity, and distraction. And then in, in verses 10 through 14, we see the corruption and the persecution. There's that spiritual warfare. So as we get close to the close here, y'all, I want us to I want to throw this challenge out to us, the church, and that's this. Have their backs. Be there when they need us. And pray, pray, pray. Amen. And here's my challenge to you, Roman and Renee. Be willing to serve God in whatever way he calls you to serve. Be full of the Holy Spirit, like Stephen. And honor Holy Scripture. I love this, what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. That's some good. That's some good stuff from Paul, right there. But here's one other thing: in this journey, I want you to remember you you have no idea whose life you're going to impact for God's glory. Amen. Think about Stephen having the impact he had, his life and death that he had on Paul for God's glory. So Lisa, can I get you to bring up that one final thing for us? As I congratulate Roman for officially becoming part of the problem solving side of the equation of church. Amen. So y'all come on up. Johan, if you will get the children, if they're not already here, they're not already here. Yep, yeah, we're ready. They're already here. Okay, good deal. <laughs> Roman and Renee, y'all come on up. This is 
a certificate of ordination to Roman sermon, having been chosen one of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and capable of using the office well, was set apart publicly to the office and work of deacon by Cross Point Church, Kimbrough Center in Madisonville, on this date. Congratulations to you, my brother. Okay, so I want to ask if uh, Brother Dan and Jimmy and Pastor Malcolm will come forward. If all of you will come forward at this time. And I'm just going to ask that you say a word, if you will, over Roman and Renee. Just whatever's on your heart. I don't know where that microphone went. There you go. Y'all come on up. I was I was uh, looking into the deacon and we've talked as you know and Bill Ray and I have talked several times and a passage that's very important in this is 1 Timothy 3 8. In the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. Brother, I just really appreciate your willingness to step, step up and serve your Lord. I really appreciate it. And I just want to say one thing, and that is you guys are serving your church. You serve under the Brother Del Rey, but most especially you're serving the Lord. And just understand that we all, we all have a ministry to fight. You stepped up in the leadership now, so you're going to have to bear down a little harder. You're going to have to pray a little more, a lot more, and you're going to have to study your word more. Do you remember what I told y'all that when we were over in the beat The answer to all of life's problems is in a deeper walk. Christ. And as the problems come, just get in your word, get in prayer, in your prayer closet, and call us. That's why we're here. We're here to help you, man. And you got this, man, because you got the Lord Jesus Christ, blood flowing through your veins. That's why the word says no weapon formed against Romans and the Rene Sermon is going to prosper. Because he, he's got you. And we're all here for you. And I have no doubt in my mind you've done a great job. Because of, I've seen your heart. I know you love the Lord more than you love anything else. And that's all it takes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. The statement is made, how can two walk together unless they agree? Mm -hmm. I, I thought about that a lot in regard to marriage. Before I fell in love with my wife, I fell in agreement with her. <laughs> and when I got in agreement with her, I could find her, if that makes any sense. Okay? Now, your relationship with your pastor, I'll address that. Thank you for making it clear this is not a political thing. Because in both churches... It is a political thing. One church here in the area has over 40 deacons. And they had a particular Sunday where they had a move in the Spirit of God. They needed help praying for people. Only had six of them there. Hmm. There's a Greek word for that. Baloney. <laughs> <laughs> we can do better than that. How about an amen? Amen. amen. I remember when I met you guys at the House of Hope. I saw the hand of God on you. I can't say that to everybody I see but I saw the hand of God on you. This is a new season of me for it's a good one. It's a good one. You're going to be stretched in your ability to trust other leaders because that's common. There's a dynamic tension among leadership people. If they didn't have giftings, that wouldn't be there. So you're going to learn to love each other 
You'll learn to forgive each other. Quickly. Quickly. My church, I thought I was the exception to every rule. Jeremy, my church, uh, they, they tell me one man can only take care of about 50 people. Well, I built my church up to 200. <laughs> and it collapsed back to 50. <laughs> I built it up to 200 again and it collapsed back to 50. Are you seeing a trend here? <laughs> and I realized that I needed help. Pastor, you're a wise man. Or lazy, one of the two. I, <laughs> I would never say that. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll share one more thing. I met a man in Tulsa. I know this is generations ago, it doesn't mean anything to you. But he was Oral Roberts' pastor. So he was obviously an amazing wow. man yeah. in his own right. And Dr. Baker invited me up to preach for him. And I got there on a Wednesday night, Roman. They had 1,200 people there on a Wednesday night. That church had grown like crazy. Pastor Lisa, I went back the next year on a Sunday morning. I'm thinking, oh, that's going to be great. <laughs> Less than 200 people there. Why? He hadn't involved any other leadership people. And the thing collapsed under its own weight. There are good days ahead for this church. And this is... One of those salient moments that we'll look back and we'll see it, that the base grew broader and the tower can go taller now because of this moment. Thank you all. Thank you for involving me today. I appreciate it. Love you guys. So we've got a couple of things uh, we're going to do before we wrap up today. You know, as as uh, Dan read the scripture. I couldn't help but think, you know, Paul may not have had any children. Because it's talking about how you got to keep the children in life. <laughs> so that's the first time I ever thought about it like that. But but uh, you know, you know <laughs> you know, it's uh, that in itself. Those of us who are parents know that that, that is a daunting task. And the gifts that you're given from your children by God, um, we can never lose sight of that. That's, that's really important. I love y'all, and yeah. uh, I'm just Lord looking forward. It. I'm just looking forward to it. So, I, yeah. right. Lord bless you. so I want to y'all go ahead and have a seat. Um, I want to encourage y'all to read three Roman and Renee. But certainly the church, if you, if you desire to. But um, and it was so crazy because then has on the board out in, in the children's church spiritual gifts but I had written down Ephesians 4.1 1 Corinthians 2 12, uh, 4 through, 1 Corinthians 12 4 through 11 and Romans 12 3 through 8 these are, these are the, the distribution of the gifts as given by the Holy Spirit God and Jesus and we see that in the New Testament and I just want to encourage you use those gifts. Figure them out if you haven't already, but be prepared to use them to God's glory. And Because that's why I gave them to you. Okay? I'm just letting you know that for a fact. So I'm going to ask all the, the, the family, if y'all will just get the kids and, and the adults. What? Oh, we're still on? Is that what you're saying? Turn it off? Say goodbye? Say goodbye. <laughs>